What's up, my people? What's going on? What's good with you? I appreciate you being here. Another edition of Boxing History every night. Ready to get this thing kicking off per usual. Big shout out to those already in the mix here. Salute to Nick Hammer, who dropped in with the comment saying big up. I'm looking forward to this one in the playback game. Appreciate it, Nick. As always, hold it down over there on your end across the pond, buddy. Also, salute to Dan, the man. He's already in the mix here. Salute to you, Dan. Appreciate you being here. Hey, we're going to have a great discussion here tonight on a great fighter who defied odds at both welterweight and middleweight. So I look forward to this one, Dan. This is certainly Dan Mitch's the greatest hit. If you haven't seen it, do check out that Tommy Ryan video. It is on the channel. So salute to you. If you check that out, if you haven't checked it out yet, get over there right now. Tommy Ryan, you'll find out a lot about the great champion who's kind of gotten forgotten a little bit in the annals of history, probably because there's no actual footage of him in action. But that being said, that doesn't take away his greatness. He was able to accomplish a lot of great things in the sport. And as we dive into his career and resume, you will see that that is very well the case right there. So I appreciate you all tuning in, ready to dive into this particular subject matter for sure. So, salute to Flat Boxing. Flat Boxing has dropped in the mix here as well. Flat Boxing, be sure to check out Flat. Give them a like and subscribe. Hey, hit the like while you're here as well. If you haven't subscribed, feel, feel free to do so. But check out Flat Boxing, another astute young gentleman in the history of the sport. So I have to give him his props. A lot of good discussions going down there on the channel. So do go over there and check that out. If you haven't yet, do so now. Flak Boxing. That's Flak, F-L-A-K. So it'll be easy to find. So I appreciate you being here, Flak, of course. And, hey, we got to get it on in fight night as well. This uh, running running rivalry we have right there. So we're going to make it happen for sure. We're going to make it happen. But, uh, yeah, without further ado, though, we're here to talk about the great Tommy Ryan. I know you've heard of him before. He's been in the mix on a number of occasions as far as thinking about the history of the welterweight division and the history of the middleweight division. His name probably hasn't been mentioned as much as it probably should be mentioned, but that being said, that's why we're here today or tonight, depending on where you are. It could be morning. That's why we're here. And here for this early portion, I, I have the pleasure of it not just being myself, but I'm going to invite in a buddy of mine, goes by the name of Random Acoustic Thoughts, and we're going to help to, or he's going to help to dive into this discussion as we talk about Tommy Ryan and his career, some of the fights that happened, the fights that didn't happen that we would have liked to have seen, but overall, it's just going to be one heck of an experience, so without further ado, I'm going to invite in my man, Random Acoustic Thoughts. Salute to you, Random. I appreciate you being here, of course. And as always, I look forward to the discussion. How's it going with you, Random? Big up, 86. Thanks for having me, brother. Everything's good. I had a show. I had a gig last night. So I'm feeling a little bit numb from the, the after effects of the beer. But otherwise, otherwise, I'm doing well, man. Just ready to go into work in a little while. <laughs> Want to jump in on your discussion here on uh, Tommy Ryan. So thanks for having me, man. Good to go. Good to go. I appreciate that right there, Random. I appreciate that for sure. Um, so, yeah, we're going to dive into that real quick. Hold up. I see someone. Okay, I see you, son. Make it do what it do. Shout out to my mom who decided to drop in uh, for this discussion right there. I appreciate you, uh, mother, for being in the mix. This is going to be a good one. So I always enjoy that you check it out, be able to share this knowledge and boxing history yourself down there in the great state of Arkansas or Arkansas as some say but without further ado we might as well jump into it so the man himself the man himself is Tommy Ryan once again that's who we're going to be discussing I'm going to put a graphic on the screen right now as a matter of fact and I think that you all will get an appreciation for the great Tommy Ryan just given the fact that he is he has an impeccable record when it really when it really boils down to the finer detail, when you think about just him as a whole, 82 wins, two losses, 13 draws, six no contests, or six no decisions, rather, 
in two no contests. He had 68 knockouts in those 82 wins. He's from Redwood, New York. Tommy Ryan, he had a stint in which he was adopted as a youngster, and he ended up ultimately running away from home or leaving home, however you want to slice it, at some point during that period as he got a little bit older in life. And thinking off top, I believe he ended up going to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, I believe. But I'm going to double check on that. Uh, but that being said, you see the record right there. So, you know, if you're going to put up those type of numbers, then that means you must have been pretty solid there in the ring. And he was one of these guys who was noted for his ability to box from a fundamental scientific standpoint because he was very he was very astute to the game in itself. So he'll fall in the mix with those Corbett's, Professor Mike Donovan's here in modern times, or your Mayweather's, your your Crawford's or, or whomever that are technicians of the sport. This was very much Tommy Ryan, and he was touted for his great footwork as well. He was very elusive, and he knew just how to stay in range when dealing with opponents. So as I dove through his career in making the video on his particular career, that's one of the things that stood out. It's just a lot of individuals had a hard time trying to solve the puzzle that was the fundamental aspect of the great Tommy Ryan there. And random, as you can see by the record in itself, I mean, he put in a lot of work here in a time or in an era there in the late 1800s through the early 1900s that had a lot of good competition just overall throughout the sport. And there are a number of great names in or around the sport in itself that we can hearken back to who were involved in this process as well. Some who were some peers of his that were dishing out, dueling their punishment during that time. But overall, Tommy Ryan, just a great, great overall boxer just in general. But he also had the resume to back. And as it was probably known, former world welterweight and world middleweight champion, which is a feat that not too many have uh, had the opportunity to gain. Yeah, that's right. Now, you know, he fought for, it looks like he fought for 20, what, 21 seasons? 87, 1887 or 1907. So he had a long career by old school standards. But um, some of the guys who fought as long as he did, some of them had a lot more had a lot more fights, but he kept a fantastic win loss record over that time. And you know, even losing like even his I think wasn't his first loss to Kid McCoy. So yeah. even in even in a very rare defeat, he's losing the class. He's not, you know. But uh, yeah, man, it seems like at the beginning of Ryan's career, at least this what's what's known to us, because again, we you know. There's a lot of uncertainty about how busy some of guys or even their opponents were actually were. But looking at box rec, seems like 87 through the 90 season, a little bit quiet. But then in uh, in 91, he beats uh, Danny Needham. And would you say 86? That's probably his first like real choice win. Yeah, no doubt about that. That is uh, certainly his choice choice win, and it's also one of the fights that you typically don't see a lot of the individuals be involved in because it went 75 rounds, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere in that neighborhood, over five hours, just a long fight where those two were battling it out. Now, there were some areas or moments in which it wasn't a lot of action in some of the rounds, and it picked up in the latter portion of it, but still, just to think about 75 or 70 plus rounds in general, over five hours of fighting, that's insane. Yeah, and, uh, you know, obviously when when the fight has the potential to be that long, certain matchups, you know, they're going to game plan to have something left in the tank. You know, there's like a meta game of that overlying stamina and damage that adds up over when you're basically just keep adding rounds. But uh, pretty incredible and shows, you know, not all wins are created equal equally. Like if you're fighting seventy something rounds, you know you translate it into today's into like twelve round fights, title fights. I think this wasn't this for the American welterweight championship. 
It was listed, it was billed as the World Welterweight Championship in all actuality. So there was probably a semblance of some American being in there, but it was billed for the World Welterweight Championship as well. So this was practically all of the marbles. And real quick, I did want to say salute to Dan. He's right. It's Michigan. Michigan is where Tommy Ryan ran off to. That's where he started selling newspapers and all that stuff, learning to fight, etc. It was Michigan. I mentioned Pittsburgh. I guess Pittsburgh was on my mind. Salute to Pittsburgh. But certainly Michigan is the state that he uh, ended up going to. Yeah, that whole Midwest thing. It looks like early in his career, he's fighting in Detroit, Gross Point, which is like a suburb of Detroit. Grand Rapids, Michigan, Chicago, Shelby and, Shelby and Sheffield. Indiana and Illinois, uh, yeah, and the Needham fight in Minneapolis, yeah. So he's in that region. Uh, I'm not, sh- I'm not as familiar with him as other guys, but scrolling down, it looked like in '94 he made his way down to Boston, fought in New York, in Connecticut as well, as well as back up in the Midwest. So he did move around a little bit, but yeah, that that initial making his name, and I'd be interested. Well, I guess. I don't know how popular it is to research his early career as far as in the archives, but I'd be interested to see some of these guys like Ryan, how much work they actually did early in their careers, like their initial seasons. Cause he doesn't have a lot. He doesn't have a lot of high level work in those first few seasons. And also not a lot of fights by the stands of the time. But uh, I know you've done some research on him. Did you, it, were there suggestions that like many of these other great fighters that he was busier than we know about, and we can, you know, certainly know, like specifically in early in his career, Josh. So, you know, I always go with that notion that there were likely some types of fights and things that were taking place in and around what the fighters were doing and what is listed on their official record. I would believe I believe that might have been the case with Tommy Ryan as well, because he got his start, as I mentioned selling newspapers and this is detailed in the video we have on the channel and essentially he got into it with some of the other newsies around that time and that ended up being or or he ended up fighting and it was a police officer that ultimately got him into the sport so he then went to the gym and started to get the official training so I have no doubt there were that there were probably some instances of things that were taking place or fights that were taking place, not unlike the majority during that period, that probably aren't recorded and aren't listed as an official record. Uh, but it, it all depends on the lens from which you want to look at them. Just thinking about how some people may view some of those unrecorded fights, maybe considering them exhibitions or just considering them fights in themselves, not necessarily being official, but most certainly he was one of those individuals who I'd imagine had some other fights that probably didn't make it into the ledger just by virtue of the fact that it was kind of the way of the time. And a lot of these individuals were actually making their money. That's how they made their money, how they applied their trade. So most certainly when any opportunity came about, you were going to take advantage of it. Right. Yeah. It's hard to know exactly. And also like the newspapers, you know, if you weren't notable yet that you may not actually be mentioned, you might be grouped in with the prelims were good as far as like recapping a or previewing or recapping a card, you know, at this time, like if you weren't notable, even if you later became so like that might be lost to the record. They just wouldn't have an official announcement that you would won until until you became someone of note so once once someone's a somebody then it's, it's a lot easier to track their whereabouts their fight to fight record but yeah early in the career it's hard to know because in this time a lot of guys would just beat up a lot of like inexperienced you know fellow prospects and and just local lads to earn the right to f- fight these big fights basically saying I, i've taken on all comers in my area now i want to fight someone who's a top guy regionally and you know, the athletic clubs and promoters would, the matchmaking was pretty good. A lot of times they, depending on what they actually were trying to achieve, you know, showcase fight or an actual top build fight, you know, on both sides, because those would be more expensive. Same thing with the rounds. Sometimes the shorter rounds fights because the purse isn't long enough for a longer fight. You see that with Ryan, it seems like he had some, some like he wins in the early parts of his career. He had some, some slower seasons though. Like, what was it? So was it 90? He No, it was 91. Yeah, 91 season he got Danny Needham. 
And he also, yeah. uh, but 92 is kind of slow, you know, like a, by his standards, it was a kind of a slow season. But then in 93, you know, he draws with mysterious Billy Smith uh, twice, I think. No, once in 93 and once in 94. But he also beats mysterious Billy Smith. That's a great win yeah. in 94. And, and then in 95, the non pareil Jack Dempsey, I mean. Certainly. Come on now. Now he's talking about now he's getting up there with the real cream. Yes, yeah, certainly. You know, in, within pugilism. I'm just let you go off on it, Josh. I'm just shut right up. <laughs> no, no, no. Certainly that that is legit right there. Those are some top level boxers. Of course, we all know of them. We've heard some of the names. Real quick before I dive into that, I want to say shout out to Bush One G. Bush One G. Salute to you there on Twitch. Appreciate you dropping by. And again, shout out to the man, the Nugget Crew, a.k.a. Boxing Beta Fight Showcases. Appreciate you dropping in here, buddy. Uh, he also says Sugar Ray is the greatest of all time. All right, good stuff right there, uh, the Nugget Crew. You're not in the minority there, certainly not in the minority. Uh, Dan, he dropped some good tidbits uh, mentioning that uh, Needham had o- fought over 100 round, uh, over an over 100 round fight, the longest fight ever, and a couple of 80 rounders, which is insane. They compare, and Dan also compared uh, Ryan to Ketchell in terms of how he was dealing out punishment there at a younger age, dealing with grown men. Also mentioned the railroad camps over a thousand fights before pro and taught himself. No one ever trained him. He's a natural great master of counter punching and footwork. Good stuff right there, Dan. Yeah, that is the case. He was touted for those in those uh, individual attributes and. I mean, the stats, I think, at least from what we can get just based on his record, can back it without a doubt. But certainly getting back to what you were mentioning there, random acoustic thoughts, that, I mean, he 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 just went on a tear there early on, and he had some great opponents that he ended up fighting. Former world welterweight champion, mysterious Billy Smith, one of the most enigmatic characters in the sport of boxing just in general if you don't know of him certainly check them out we have a video on the channel that dives into it a little bit it requires a bit of updating he's a guy who could be very erratic had a lot of disqualifications as well i from what i recall i recount 11 disqualifications in his career was i believe is the most of uh, any boxer in history but unless someone knows of someone else out there but mysterious billy smith world champion right there also uh, Red Abikisic Thoughts noted some others that he was in with just in, in virtue of that. Of course, Danny Needham, that was his chance at fighting for the world welterweight title. And it didn't work out overall for him, but he had been in a bunch of great fights. And then, of course, the name of note, of without a doubt, is the non pareil Jack Dempsey. That's the first, the original Jack Dempsey. And he's one of the greatest fighters of all time, former world middleweight champion. Now, when he ended up fighting non-pareil Jack Dempsey, uh, as anyone may recall, non-pareil, he had bouts with tuberculosis, so he wasn't necessarily his best self at that particular time, but uh, that is, you know, it's a win, it's a name win, but of course the tuberculosis piece of it is outside of Tommy Ryan's control. It just so happened. So non Jack Dempsey ended up dying at a fairly young age because of the fact that he had a bout with tuberculosis, which was, as some say, almost a death sentence during that period. I've talked about it. We've talked about it on a number of other cases as well. There were a number of boxers who, who had their life cut short by virtue of tuberculosis. Joe Gans, he's another one uh, where this was the case. And then there were some who, after they retired, they ended up catching it not too long thereafter. Jim Driscoll, George Gottfried, uh, Peter Jackson, he had tuberculosis. That ended up killing him at about 42. He was still technically, I guess, active in some sense. So it was no joke at that particular time. But um, those are good wins there on the ledger of of, uh, Tommy Ryan and to be able to gain them when he did, of course, they had to add to and help as far as just bolstering up and and boosting him. And even to get to that point in Michigan, as a matter of fact, he had to battle his way through a lot of top, a a lot of top guys from a local perspective there in Michigan to get the respect that he ultimately was able to gain over the course of his career while he was in Michigan. And so I'm going to pull up uh, a notable list uh, of opponents that he ended up 
fighting and random accused of dog. Tell me what do you think of this? Danny Needham, Charles Kidd McCoy, Jack Dempsey, Nonpareil, Billy Stiff, Jack Bonner, Jack Root, Kid Carter, Dick O'Brien, Tommy West, George Green, aka the original Young Corbett, Mysterious Billy Smith, Frank Craig. I mean, top top tier right there as far as resume is concerned. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, like I said, even like dropping the getting his first loss to Kid McCoy. I mean, Kid McCoy was a a vicious puncher and a powerful fighter at that time. Yeah, he, uh, Ryan was able to get some really quality wins and unlike a lot of guys, so he has like a, a nice middle point, almost like an echo of a, of a modern career, like precursor to that sort of thing where he had some padding early in the career, to get the experience. And then he had the high level fights, but Considering the length of his career, he wasn't particularly busy in a lot of those seasons. Yeah. I mean, some of those seasons he got it in, the 97, his 98. And actually, even like his 99 season was respectable, but like 97, 98, yeah, even 99, he's, he's, he's pretty busy. It's just in his career, you know, he's fighting guys like, for instance, in the, eight, in the 96 season, he loses to Charles Kid McCoy. Now they rematch in the 97 season. But Kid McCoy in that time goes from 26, 2, and 6 when they first fight. In the second fight, at least per box rec, he's 40 wins, 2 losses, and 6. So he's piled on all that experience, 14 more wins. Well, plus the one, so 13 extra wins on top of beating him just, just from season to season. And that's something we see in, uh, you know, with other opponents like Mysterious Billy Smith, uh, where they have multiple fights, but they're at different places. And because of the amount of fights they have and how quickly they have them, they're evolving rather quickly. So the same matchup can change over time. That's where you see in other guys, like, you know, my favorite guy to study Sam Langford, you know, his, his 12 plus fight series with uh, some of his rivals, you know, they're at different points as they meet across their careers. And uh, yeah, Tommy Ryan is definitely a guy there. There were guys who got multiple swings at him. Or vice versa, he got multiple cracks at them, like with McCoy, which uh, yeah. and with multiple fights against certain powerful fighters, that list of individual names obviously that expands. That's not how many fights he had against notable people. That's just maybe some of the more prominent individual notable people. But yeah, right. He was down to take a swing at guys a couple times, uh, which is respectable because there are examples where people get a win over a good fighter. They won't they won't see him again. So luckily in this time, you know, the the manly art, there was a lot of pressure on these guys to, uh, they didn't always go along with the program, but there was a lot of pressure applied and exerted upon these athletes to fight at a high level, to have those big matchups, especially if they want that money. Certainly. Certainly, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, money talks, as they say, money certainly talks. But no, you, you touched on some great things there. And this is on top of a number of exhibitions that actually took place. So Charles K. McCoy is someone who ultimately, I guess you can say, ended up being his greatest rival in some sense. And the story goes, and there was reporting to match such. And this is what is captured in a video that was completed on him is that McCoy was someone that he actually, he being Tommy Ryan, brought into his camp while McCoy was a bit younger and earlier in his, early in his career. And in doing so, he, of course, showed Charles McCoy varying things. And, and there were some instances, I know for sure one, but there may have been a couple uh, of instances in which Tommy Ryan really gave it to the, younger, fresher McCoy during some of those training sessions where sparring was involved and all of that stuff. And it was stated that McCoy really didn't like such, and he kind of harbored some ill will towards him uh, because of him showing him up in some of those training sessions. And when they ultimately ended up fighting, I believe it was the first time that they fought, McCoy did so under the pretense that he was going through financial situations and he wanted to actually fight just so he could get the money or whatever. So with that in mind, Tommy Ryan agreed to do so, just thinking that, OK, I'm going to be helping an old friend, old sparring partner, training partner, etc. 
as he's on his journey, he's going through a situation right now, and he didn't really go all out in training for this particular fight. And by the time that the fight came, McCoy, he had put in all of the work that needed to be done to really make this uh, or to really ensure that he was in the best shape of his life and was going to be 100 percent game for whatever came. And he ended up defeating Tommy Ryan because of such. So that's uh, one of the things that I reported in the actual video that is done on him on the channel. So ultimately what that's what they end up doing is fueling the fire in some sense. So they did become a rival though. The fights thereafter certainly probably didn't have that same type of just elevated view or just the overall feel of that first fight with Tommy Ryan being in there and being put in a situation where he had to go a bit harder than he probably thought would be the case. Uh, it still turned out to be something that really sparked something in both of these guys. And as we know, Charles Kitt McCoy, he's another guy when you dive into his resume, he had a lot of uh, top level opponents that were tied to him and not unlike Ryan in some sense. Yeah. He gets a bit overshadowed by some of the middleweights uh, that came thereafter who we do have on film, for instance, Stanley Ketchell, and I think that's uh, just one of those things. That it's all about timing in some cases. And Stanley Ketchell was, of course, a great fighter, big puncher. Uh, he, of course, died at a young age, former world middleweight champion. Uh, but that being said, Charles McCoy, he, he seemed to have the goods as well as a tall, long middleweight. But that being said, he's kind of his name is known. He's probably infamous in some sense, sense because he had some. Out of outside of the ring issues, there were always something going on with him, uh, and he was actually later in life uh, convicted because of murdering his wife. I believe it was his wife uh, at that particular time. So he came to be become infamous in the sport. But during that period that he was fighting, a very talented fighter during that time. So just kind of shows you how boxing is at points, sort of the ebbs and flows and how some names tend to expand a bit further beyond others uh, as you dive through things. Yeah, definitely. Uh, like the, who someone is in their day compared to how they're remembered, there are different reasons why someone might be overshadowed. Like we've mentioned before, you know, Harry Greb's 1919 season where if you're counting newspaper decisions, he's got 45 wins without a loss or a draw, but Dempsey won the world title, the heavy, the title, you know, the heavyweight title. This is still the marquee division very much. And that just overshadows possibly the greatest season of all time. Certainly one of the most winningest, just beautiful looking seasons of all time that Harry Grab had, but it gets overshadowed. And then you throw in the fact that there's no surviving footage of him actually fighting, just some training footage with, with, uh, like some uh, some face off footage with uh, the great Mickey Walker, and then also some training footage at Jack O'Brien's gym. An older Jack O'Brien, you get to see how ripped Jack O'Brien was, even as an old man. He was probably like in his upper forties by that point, still looking sharp with the big with the big barrel chest. Jack O'Brien, very another guy who's not remembered the way he should be. He was a great fighter, but he Jack O'Brien, from what I've seen, kind of did his own thing. You know, he did a lot of six round bouts. So a lot of the title fights in his era were longer. So he did a lot of six round bouts, but he fought a who's who. And he became a huge name. And even later in O'Brien's career, when he was past prime, he could still pull fights with guys like uh, Sam Langford and the great Jack Johnson and some of these guys. Who else did he fight? Ketchell? Who are, he was like some guys because they're big, like Sugar Ray, mm -hmm. uh, Sugar Ray Robinson, Muhammad Ali. When you're big enough, you can pull big fights all the way to the end. You know, and actually, Tommy Ryan was like that. Didn't he go out on a fight against uh, Hugo Kelly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what uh, Dan was mentioning there, mentioning hardline ranked Hugo Kelly, like number 60 greatest of all time, only 59 fighters better than uh, Hugo Kelly, according to hardline, who really knows this stuff. So, yeah, Hugo Kelly, he fought Hugo Kelly in his final fight of his career. As a matter of fact, Tommy Ryan's final fight of his career. Yeah, it's heavy. So he's fighting a, a heavy duty. I'm not sure. I'm thinking Kelly was already was a middleweight at that point. So he's fighting prominent yeah. people. 
you know, after your first couple, first few seasons of those 21 seasons are slow, but once he gets into it, what was it 89 or 90? I forget the Needham fight. He's going. And then even with some, some shorter round fights, because the thing is, okay, when you're prominent, which obviously he was several seasons in, he's a prominent fighter. Athletic clubs will offer you pretty good money if you're prominent enough to come fight a local lad. And so you can get the purse. Maybe there's a side bet going on, either with you and the guy or you and his manager or your manager and his manager or just betters in general. There are people putting money behind you. So you can make good money fighting overmatched opponents because it's a live gate. It's a live gate errand. The athletic clubs are trying to pull top boxers. They can't always afford to throw up a purse for two top boxers in a single fight. And that's where you see a lot of the stuff in the record is there's a business, there's an interaction. The more dangerous the fight, the more money they want. And that's, that's happened to certain fighters when you're a certain level of good. People might fight you, agree to fight you, but there's a purse. And sometimes that's prohibitively expensive for the athletic club. So not necessarily a direct duck, but there were the financial aspects. Certainly some of the athletes were able to twist the knife to really get the maximum payday, even as far back as this. But, uh, but Ryan sprinkled in some really good opponents in there with that, what we would call padding, um, to the degree that we're aware, once again, of, of these opponents' full records. Like, if BoxRec says someone was debuting, that doesn't necessarily mean they never fought. It's just going back this far, their yeah. database is incomplete. And also the reporting was incomplete. Some stuff just cannot be known at this point because, uh, because it wasn't in the papers, even if later those guys were a big deal. But Oh, let's see. He says, oh, four, Jack O'Brien. Oh, yeah. yeah, O'Brien's 1902 season is really something to... Like, that's a couple seasons before the 04 you mentioned, but, like, Jack O'Brien's 1902 season. You want to see a busy season as far as six-round bouts? That's the one. But, uh, yeah, so, like we were saying, like, Ryan mixed in really good, really good company, although not all of those those wins and fights were over the top-shelf competition, but he had enough of it. Just in more modern generations, generally the padding happens at the start. Then they get up to a higher level, and then once they get up to that title level, they have some big fights, and they retire when they can't win enough of them in a row or keep, can't even win. Back in this day, you could have the smaller, less important fights and still make money because the live crowd wants to see you fight, even if you're fighting a guy who doesn't have much of a chance, you know, just a local favorite. What do you think, Josh? Yeah, yeah, no, no, I'm with you there for sure. Uh, Dan mentions Dave Barry, pretty good fighter from middleweight to heavyweight, uh, uh, brother of all time, great Jimmy Barry. Also, Barry was the referee in a long count Dempsey Tunney fight. Nice little nugget right there, Dan. That's pretty awesome right there. I did look through Higo Kelly's re Higo Kelly's resume as well. He does have a heck of a resume. I will say that. He has a heck of a resume. Uh, Dan mentions after winning the middleweight championship, Ryan fought over 50 fights, never lost a title either, but only 12 of these fights were for the title. Yeah, and, you know, that's something that was customary, especially dating back to older times where fighters, even when they had the title, they would continue to fight, but it didn't necessarily mean they were world title fights. They would sometimes just have fights uh, that would, I guess you can say, be considered stay busy fights, fights, but they would fight against top competition, uh, certainly back then. So the notion of a stay busy fight wasn't necessarily the same as it is uh, when we mention it today, or at least when it's mentioned in some lights today. But uh, yeah, certainly it was customary that these guys would fight some varying opponents as they were going through the process of uh, you know, just taking in that newfound fame and going through or uh, continuing at least to just kind of reap the benefits of becoming champion and just continuing to add up on such. And I went over to Cyber Boxing Zone, which is very, uh, very much a good uh, site as far as they de detail a lot of the stuff outside of Box Rec that is related to like exhibitions other fights that were scheduled and potentially uh, were going to happen, some that did happen. They tried to provide that detail over there at Cyber Boxing Zone, so just salute to them. So I'm looking. He had some exhibitions with the likes of Joe Chewinski, the California Terror, light heavyweight, 
uh, which is uh, which is top notch right there. I'm looking at 1894. It looks like 1894 is when he first uh, ended up taking on him. He had exhibitions early in his career in 92. Uh, he had exhibition with Bob Fitzsimmons, uh, of all people, which is pretty cool. He had an exhibition with Jim Hall, another top level fighter from that period, big time puncher, not a huge name. Henry Baker, another guy who had a pretty solid resume. And interestingly enough, Bob Armstrong, former world colored heavyweight champion, Bob Armstrong, who was a pretty big, solid guy, solidly built guy as well. They're about 6'4", uh, just over 200 pounds. So he, he was a big dude. And believe it or not, he actually, and this is someone who came up in our last discussion, as a matter of fact, there. And I know there was a lot of things surrounding such, but in 1895, uh, Cyber Boxing Zone listed exhibition that was going to happen with Barbados Joe Walcott. It says the bout was scheduled, but the outcome is unknown. So I'm assuming that it probably didn't happen, but he did fight a common opponent in 1896 in George Kidd Levine. But I think we could uh, stay there for a second right there. So Barbados Joe Walcott, he's someone who we all know who wanted a, a former world welterweight champion who at five, one and a half defied a number of odds as he was on his way up working to get to the status that he was able to achieve. And he was accustomed to fighting men who were actually bigger than him. So it would have been the case if he did. In, in a contest with Tommy Ryan, just as was the case with the majority of his stuff, that he would have been giving up height, reach, and in most cases, weight uh, to a guy like Tommy Ryan. But Walcott was one of those guys who was able to adapt and overcome, and I know it came up. So we looked into, in looking into some of the information and reporting that was out there at the time, yeah, this was a fight that realistically could have happened. I know that last time I was on, I was saying that uh, there probably wasn't a parallel because of the fact that I was looking at it from the standpoint that I believe Walcott may have won the title in 1901 uh, before holding it until 1906. And then I know that uh, fight with um, Dixie Kidd was thrown in the mix, which was a controversial fight that really shouldn't have been a loss for uh, Joe Walcott if he got the belt reinstated. And I believe Tommy Ryan at the time had moved up to middleweight, but this seems to be a fight that was realistically out there. It was being talked about as a fight that was going to happen. Uh, I know you're able to uh, find such in that regard as well, Random. Yeah, well, uh, Walcott, had bef before even winning the welterweight title, Walcott, was a multi-weight fighter. You know, he'd been a multi-weight fighter as a lightweight, but you know, when he's chasing this um this title, he uh Ryan was one of the guys he wanted. His man uh Walcott's manager of the time, Tom O'Rourke, powerful manager, he was issuing challenges on behalf of Walcott to pretty much anyone. And uh yeah, Tommy Ryan, unfortunately for for his legacy as far as the, you know, the Star Wars enthusiast, yeah, he drew the color line at times in his career. So in spite of fighting some really powerful fighters and having a really great career, there were fights, uh, especially with Walcott, that he just did not want. And I think you might have mentioned off fair, George Byers was another, but I've actually, yeah, this isn't, I'm not going on anything written later. I'm just going on reporting of the time where, uh, I don't know if you have the clip. I can probably jump out and, and format the clip. I don't know if you have the actual clipping of the, but it was from, uh, I think it was the 1900 season. It was like May 1900. Walcott called out, was one of the call outs that he made to uh, Tommy Ryan, but Ryan drew the color line. They were kind of making fun of him in the in the Boston Globe, saying that he said, you know, he declared loudly that, um, they said, uh, let me see if I can remember it. Walcott's recent successes prompted Tommy Ryan to once again, once again draw the color line when Walcott's manager, Tom O'Rourke, asked if he was ready to fight winner take all. And uh, he had said, loud, declared loudly, he wasn't afraid of Walcott, but no one believed this to be true. That was that was at least that particular writer. That's how he was he was framing it. So there was a call out. Ryan didn't want to know, but even though he was the larger guy. But Walcott, you know, that year, 
So Walcott, he closed out 18, the 1899, the 1898 season. He finished it off a loss. But the 1899 season, Walcott went 12 and 0 with nine finishes and then started off 1900. I think he won his first four fights. And that was when this article was from. And he'd already stopped Joe Schwainsky that season. And so if there was a re, you know, like there was good reason for larger fighters to be wary of the Barbados Wonder. And I guess that included Tommy Ryan, you know, not that he didn't have a great career, but that was absolutely a matchup he avoided. And there was money there for that matchup, you know. Yeah, Dan, yeah. Uh, this isn't, this is a, uh, Ryan was already the, up at middleweight. He was already the middleweight king, but Walcott was calling him out at that time and had already beaten Schwainsky, who was a, lo- a larger fighter himself. This wasn't, this wasn't Walcott calling for champion versus champion. That may have happened later. I'm talking about this was, uh, this was in uh, 1900. This was May 1900 in the, uh, in the Boston Globe where the call out Tom O'Rourke's is- issuing challenges. Interestingly, also said that Walcott would stop any man Jeffries beat, but stop him faster than Jeffries did. And that's, that's quite a proclamation, but, uh, you know, trying to get big fights, you know, Walcott was feared enough that men his own size, once he went, ran through enough of them, even before he had the title, people were wary of him. But it also included guys in, in heavier weight classes. And Chowinski is a good example of just because you're bigger and you could be a Hall of Fame level fighter. It doesn't, doesn't mean you're automatically, you know, size counts, but Walcott was a specialist in fighting larger guys. That's, I don't want to pull it too yeah. far away from discussion of the great Tommy Ryan, but just to mention that there was absolutely a duck there. You know, if you, if you, take the color line as an as avoidance as an excuse rather than some sort of valid thing there was avoidance there but that's not unusual to him you know that was there were a lot of people who did that and it was a rich enough era they could still have a good career but the greatest careers generally you have to cross all the different lines to get to really get it enough of the all-time greats you got to you know they're represented different in their appearance so you got to fight across those lines if you want to be in the top top echelon but as far as ability and uh, Tommy Ryan was phenomenal and uh, and fought a really great career himself. Nothing to be ashamed of, other than you know now looking back, we go, oh, he should have had that fight. That's no reason to, you know, there's no reason to avoid somebody or to pretend yeah, that's been, the reason. Yeah, it would have been a great one, a very interesting one as well. Just thinking about it from an overall perspective. Real quick, salute to Bruce Gas, Boxing Jazz, and more who's dropped in the building. Appreciate you bringing in here, Bruce. Salute, brother. As always, be sure to check out Bruce Gas. Give him a like, subscribe. A lot of great content that he's dropping over there on his end. Uh, but the Bruce Gas, Boxing Jazz, and more, if you haven't heard, then you're hearing it now. Be sure to go over and check out Bruce Gas. Salute to you, Bruce. Appreciate you being here, of course, as always. And then salute to uh, Joshua Woods. Cheers there to you, Joshua. Says Ryan was great, but I think he is under the likes of Robinson or Grip. Got you there, uh, Joshua Woods. Salute to you. Appreciate you always coming in, share your dialogue. Always great to chat and discuss things with you. Yeah, I feel you there. Um, Ryan, yeah, he ranks up there with the uh, – or Joshua, rather, but he ranks up there with some of the top individuals there for that particular or, – or just thinking about that, the welterweight, middleweight, which those are the two primary divisions in which he uh, fought. And, yeah, certainly uh, Robinson and Greb, yeah, those two are definitely top echelon as well, meaning regarding both as the two greatest – Fighters that the sport is seeing, you know, you'll have varying opinions as time goes on when people discuss uh, what takes place with them. Uh, but certainly, uh, definitely, that, that's certainly worth mentioning there. Appreciate you dropping in here, Joshua. Ryan, Dan mentioned Ryan was a welterweight before Walcott was even fighting. Yep. Uh, then Ryan was dominant middleweight champion as Walcott was busy getting KO'd by Kate Levine at lightweight for the title. And Walcott lost to Mysterious Billy Smith. Mysterious Billy Smith. Former world welterweight champion George Kid Levine. So I think there was some funny business in those fights, as I mentioned with uh, with um, George Kid Levine. Yeah, I think he had to stop Levine or he would lose. Like he yeah, couldn't win on points. Kind of he, it was yeah, an it was auto loss. Yeah, but it's, also, them, but it's also Dan. But just to mention the point at which you know when he was calling the article I have when he was calling out Tommy Ryan, he'd gone twelve and zero the prior season. 
with nine finishes. He'd had a better season than Ryan. And then that season that he called him out, he'd already won four in a row and he'd stopped Choyinsky. So, you know, he wasn't busy losing to anybody at that point. He was at the point, the article I have, he had lost his last fight of, of the season prior to his 12 and 0 season, but he was on 16 fight streak with, I think 11 stoppages at the point that the article I've seen, he wasn't like a, he wasn't busy losing in any way at all. In fact, he'd knocked out a guy, Ryan, you know, had a lot of respect for Chuyinsky. So it, it's, you know, we have to look at the timing of things. Things were happening very quickly in this time. There's not a, it's not always like today where there's a multi-year window for a fight to be absolutely choice because these guys are putting in the work. How many guys today are fighting 12 times in a year? Yeah. That includes really anything high level. So, you know, the window might only be a year or two when something's viable, especially fighters like this, where both of them had been fighting for a decent amount of time compared to the field. By the time this was all happening, you know, they were all they were all pretty deep in the deep in the game. The fight didn't happen. But, yeah, certainly when somebody's calling out, if you keep losing, you're calling guys out. It doesn't mean the same thing. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Um, but, no, I, hey, I, there is um, there is certainly you make some um, there, there, there are certainly some uh, great points you have made there. And I think it's legit. I found some stuff myself there where they're referencing. They, hey, the people were actually looking for this fight between Ryan and Rokot, uh, Ryan and Walcott, as a matter of fact. And I wish it was one that would, could be that would have been made because I think it would have answered a lot of questions. Now, this is only a few, but there are a number of articles out there where they reference it. So Joe Walcott threw the challenge out there. And I know in this one instance that is mentioned in this particular article, Ryan said that he was superior to Walcott and therefore he wasn't going to fight him. Uh, and George Byers, who who I mentioned previously, who had came up during that time, and I mentioned it in George Byers' video, he was another one that would have been a game changer to have on the resume there for Tommy Ryan. And that fight ultimately did not happen. And those are two that I think would have been extra adage. Now, it doesn't take away from how great of a fighter that he was. But certainly that would have been that extra sauce added to the mix. And they did take on the Harlem coffee cooler, Frank Craig. And I know on like Box Rex, for instance, I believe they probably have it billed as a middleweight title fight. Whether it was truly that, I don't know. But this was it. This ended up being one that turned out to be a standout win of his because Frank Craig, one of the great former color middleweight champions from that particular period, who was competing at the time. So I think it's just one of those things where, or one of those situations where there were, like we see with many fighters, there tend to be some situations where, hey, there is a fight or two, whatever it may be, that ultimately doesn't happen that we as a people would have wanted to have seen. And that is not any different than what's taking place here with, uh, Tommy Ryan, but I know that Walcott fight is a fight that was sought. That is no doubt about it. So I have those listed there. Here goes a couple of them right here, Dad, that speak to that specifically and that avoidance of Joe Walcott. Now, many felt that uh, I know that there were some who felt that he would have beat Joe Walcott, but the fact that the fight didn't happen is one of those things that can't go unnoticed for sure. It's just the way it is, just the way it was at that particular time. But some guys, hey, they took on all. And and we know that Tommy Ryan did fight uh, Frank Craig. So I have no doubt that, I mean, if it could have happened, he would have been competitive in that particular contest. Just one that we didn't get to see. Not unlike Wills versus Dempsey, et cetera, that we're accustomed to as well. Yeah, it's just how that goes. I, I texted you the article, the short article that I had from the Globe and a couple other graphics, if you can use them at all. But uh, no big deal. Yeah, but sometimes it's like with Fury. You can we can celebrate his his powerful wins. He has powerful wins, right? But we can also acknowledge, yeah. like, say if you say, well, he didn't want to fight Joshua. Well, I mean, based on what he actually did and Usyk, like, no, he's not doing. It. He's doing something else. He's fighting. Uh, a, a rookie, a, 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 sorry, a champion martial artist, but a rookie boxer. And uh, as far as I know, so it's yeah. you know it's that that's the duality of man. You know, you have your have your money grabs or your your risk to ratio, your risk to money ratio 
favorable, and then sometimes you have the tough ones. And that's that's still true today. It was definitely true back then. And Walcott was a guy who made a lot of guys think twice. And if you look, that doesn't mean he could beat everyone that Tommy Ryan beat, or even that he could necessarily beat Ryan. It's it's kind of like a Sam Langford, Jack Johnson, once Langford hit his prime kind of deal. There's still yeah. a question about who will win, but it's known fact it's known and widely reported at the time that it was a duck because all the pressure of the press is brought to bear not just the management but the press and the fighter says well i don't like with johnson he's like well i don't care what the public think you know that's what he said when he broke contract when he was supposed to be his title defense after beating tommy burns win or lose he was supposed to fight langford that next may and he broke contract said i don't care what the co- the public thinks that's fine mayweather did some of that right can't spend legacy that's cool yeah. but when we're talking legacy you can't buy legacy either. So you get to keep the money. So, you know, if they're guys who avoid fights, same with like Dempsey and Wills. Dempsey, you know, until Wills was in his mid thirties, he didn't want to know about that fight until the guy got old. Cause he was like six years younger. That's it's just what it is, man. They have to, their legacy has to deal with that. Um, even if they're great fighters, if like same with fury, if he retires after this part of the, there's going to be an asterisk there. Like wouldn't fight Usyk when it was the biggest fight that could be made in boxing. Probably. Certainly. Certainly. No. Yeah. That's a very good example right there. Cause uh, Usyk, he has been calling him out. He had agreed to his terms and all of that stuff. And uh, still, still uh, no bite from Fury who was going on to, of course, do the MMA fight. But that being said, I mean, this is an opportunity at becoming the undisputed uh, world champion and, or the undisputed world heavyweight champion. And that's something he's mentioned in the past that he was gunning for. So it's pretty crazy that he would pass up the opportunity in this particular instance. So interesting right. how, they, loses, how they operate. But, yeah. And it's interesting because sometimes like Jimmy Britt wasn't going to fight Joe Gans, right? He's claiming the white title over yeah. on the West coast. And wouldn't they were, his family was connected. So they were pressuring to not, you know, don't, make a stink of it gans or we'll we'll have a we'll pull strings and have you know interracial bouts banned in california you know the but then brit lost so i think it was battling nelson and then later on yeah they did have that fight so you know if fury ends up losing before he retires maybe he will make that fight um but yeah it can be tough to match these top guys uh these top guys you know, give them credit for their career, also making note of the gaps that are there. And that's true. That's true of everybody. Everybody has gaps, but uh, some of them are more prominent than others. And some of these, some of these fighters like Walcott was famously avoided by a lot of guys. And uh, there was a built in excuse at the time to say, Oh, the color line and the sort of the, there were enough people that would go with that because of whatever was going on with them emotionally that you could get away with it, but you did pay a price in the press. And today looking back, you know, I definitely make note of that. But, uh, I have to bust into work. I don't want to end on anything negative. So yeah, Tommy Ryan, great fighter, great stylist, tough as nails, you know, powerful resume. And one of the most, you know, one of the most notable fighters of that, of that earlier era, there are guys with bigger resumes, but he had a fantastic success relative to what he attempted to do. So yeah, great fighter. And uh, I would just really appreciate you having me on 86. Hey, no, anytime, anytime. It's always great, you know, to have these discussions. I enjoy being able to have have the opportunity to uh, talk about these great fighters and you contribute, chime in with some of the information that you have. I know you've put in a lot of work doing research on a number of these great fighters yourself. So it is uh, it's a pleasure, as always, to have you on Random Acoustic Thoughts anytime. Uh, it's certainly, hey, everyone, definitely check him out. Random acoustic thoughts. If you look it up, there there should only be one that pops up. It is, it is this random here itself. So I appreciate you taking the time, random to uh, drop by. As a matter of fact, thanks, brother. Good stuff, and uh, I'll listen to the rest of the show at work. Take it easy, y'all. All right, have a good one. We'll connect. All right, there. Random acoustic thoughts, folks. Random acoustic thoughts. Appreciate you. Dropping by for this discussion, uh, Archie Moore made sure Marciano Valles fight was not going to happen. <laughs> Good stuff there, uh, Joshua Woods. Yeah, I guess so. That is a pretty interesting one there for sure. Uh, we're talking about the great Tommy Ryan uh, holding it down from, you know, they, they listed him as Tommy Ryan from Syracuse at points as well. Uh, Syracuse, so I guess that Syracuse area area in general. Dan says, random wrong case, close your wrong. Slanders to say about Ryan, you got some study to do that. 
Hey, uh, hey, you know, I pull up some articles there, Dan. I mean, it is what it is. Hey, Tommy was a great fighter without a doubt. But, you know, not every fighter gets to fight every fight. Uh, there are some that we want to see that it doesn't always that, that we didn't always get. It still happens to this day, as a matter of fact. And it is a pretty interesting thing for sure. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. Shout out to the boss dropped in. The boss just dropped in to say hello. Appreciate you, the boss. I know it's late there, but it is the weekend. So all things are a go on the weekend, right? Anything goes. So appreciate you, the boss says I'm on another stream at the same time. Oh, so you're showing love to that other stream right there, boss. That's how you feel right there. So that's how you feel. I don't appreciate it there, boss. I do not appreciate it. You're showing love to another stream when you could be here. So I had to come on there, boss. So you can be here, but you're showing love to another stream. What the heck does that say right there, boss? Don't repeat that to anyone else. Do not repeat it. <laughs> it's all good, though. Uh, we appreciate you, though, there, boss. Joshua says, uh, that's a reply to Joshua Fury. I got you right there. Yeah, Joshua uh, Fury. Yeah, that's one that could have happened right there as well, uh, Joshua uh, Josh and Josh here speaking, but yeah, certainly, uh, looks like we're going to get Fury and Gano. We're going to get Joshua versus Wilder here at some point, I'd imagine. And I look forward to, uh, that particular matchup. Cause I think it's going to be a good matchup between even at this point, even though I thought at one point a few years back, it would have been the biggest fight in boxing. It would have far excelled, I believe the, uh, numbers of the Spitz Crawford fight just because you had two heavyweights going at it. One from the UK, one from America, Joshua Wilder, both undefeated. It would have been a huge contest, but we ultimately did not get it. So it's crazy. Uh, at least it's a bit crazy. Yeah, no love for you right there. The vibes. <laughs> I feel you. I feel you. <laughs> oh, love your new look. Yeah. Had to cut off the beard, you know, cut off the beard. I'm getting used to it. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to get used to it myself right here with no uh <laughs> no beard here. Uh Bruce Gas, Bruce Gas boxes salute to you there, Dan. Shouting out Bruce Gas. The boss says about time you got rid of that Santa beard. <laughs> yeah, I was going for a James Harden type feel. Didn't quite mesh up the same way, but certainly uh it's one that uh you know I had there for a good little while. And uh it, it you know, I might grow it back at some point. I might, you know, I'll have to see how things go. But I like this kind of I'm getting used to this new look. Looks so weird when you cut off your beard after such a long period of time, because this one I have been growing for two plus years, maybe even through probably almost or near the neighborhood of three years. But yeah, just one of those things for sure. <laughs> um, so. Uh, you look a little like Tim Witherspoon now. Salute to Tim Witherspoon. I know Bruce Gass, Boxing Jazz, and more always had, you know, he's had a number of discussions with Tim Witherspoon there on his channel. Check out Bruce Gass. Check out Skywalker Boxing, who has a show. I think they do it on Sundays, Monday or Sundays, but I think it's Sundays with Tim Witherspoon Jr., the Tim and Tim show. So salute to you, Skywalker Boxing, uh, for sure. Uh, Dan mentions Bruce, Bruce Gas. Yeah, Bruce Gas had hopped on. Looks like Bruce is live over on his channel right now, as a matter of fact. Uh, actually, the other stream was boring me. Good to go. That was a sign right there, boss. That was a sign. You needed to be here. Uh, but I'm involved in a combo in, in the chat. Hey, that always tends to happen. I appreciate everyone being here as we've had these varying chats and things of that nature relating to the great – Tommy Ryan. So at the end of the day, that's why we hear the great Tommy Ryan, one of the greatest middleweights and welterweights that the sport has ever seen. I mean, there's no other way you can slice it. He's just top notch in that regard. And if you haven't, it's worthwhile to definitely dig into his career because he was a true pioneer during his period. And he has a lot of great Contest wins, victories, resume to back such. And it's pretty amazing how some of these great fighters get kind of lost in the shuffle a bit over the course of history. But I guess when you're looking for that sort of instant satisfaction or things come instantaneous, it can happen. But he's one certainly you need to keep tabs on because he was a great fighter 
during his time and uh, certainly uh, one worthwhile. Uh, the Vibes talking about people in their forties talking about the dating life. Oh my goodness, there Vibes sounds like a uh, sounds like a craze right there. <laughs> certainly sounds like something that is very interesting that to be going on right there. As a matter of fact, uh, I want to pull up the Tommy Ryan, Tommy Ryan, uh, how to knock a man out. I'm going to pull this up for a second. I'll be back in. and uh, But I want to give everyone an opportunity to check this out, as a matter of fact. It's Tommy Ryan, so I'm going to pull that up. I want everyone to uh, be able to see such. Uh, it's Tommy Ryan. We don't have any video or footage of him in action. Uh, but that being said, we do have Tommy Ryan as he is... Okay. Uh, as he is <laughs> in a, at an older age or whatever and uh, doing his thing. So with that in mind, I wanted to give an opportunity for us to check out a little bit of it. Tom Ryan even fought Denver Ed Martin when he was 42, but is now considered an exhibition. Oh, yeah, that's big time right there. Uh, Dan, Denver Ed Martin, as a matter of fact, a recent video on the channel, a recent long-form video at least, that is one on Denver Ed Martin who is – one of the great heavyweights from that particular period. Um, he he was very clever, crafty boxer. He could sometimes take, you know, end up losing some things uh, due to his chin. But that being said, a very good boxer, very good boxer overall. Give me a quick second. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen to watch this video here for a quick second. But I will... I will be back for sure. I will be back for sure. But I want everyone to check this out. In my time, I met all comers, from lightweights to heavyweights. And I retired the undefeated welterweight and middleweight champion of the world. The difference is, in my time, to win the championship, you had to knock a man out. I've heard that a generational boxer crops up every 10 years in the sport. This could be taboo, but if I had any say so, I bet that boxer is Shakir Stevenson today. Now, 100 plus years from now could tell a different story. For this video, we go 100 plus years back to a guy who at that time garnered some of the same generational praise. He is now universally considered one of the greatest fighters of all time. He was born Joseph Youngs, but the world came to know him as Tommy Ryan. Born in Redwood, New York on March 31st, 1870, Tommy Ryan's parents were of French and English descent. Ryan was left as an orphan at a young age, but was adopted by a wealthy Syracuse, New York family. At some point, Tommy would run away from his foster parents' home, settling in Detroit, Michigan, where he would sell newspapers to earn money. This turned out to change his life drastically as disputes over territory with other newsies, including those bigger, forced him to fight in order to make a stand. After licking all of the big newsies, this attracted attention, and soon enough, he was learning to apply his newfound trade in ring. This is when he adopted the Irish name Tommy Ryan, which upset some Irish Detroiters who felt that no man who wasn't of Irish ancestry should be able to take up such name. For the time being, it was Tommy Ryan of Syracuse. It was this prejudice that gave Ryan his first big break. Ring founder Nat Fleischer had the following to say of Tommy Ryan in a 1947 edition of The Ring magazine. Ryan, whose natural fighting weight was 140 pounds, was an ideal boxer. He possessed all the good qualities of a successful pugilist. He had speed, cleverness, a knockout punch, and was a keen ring general. Tommy Ryan made his professional debut on January 1st, 1887. At 5'7 and a half with a 70 and a half inch reach, Ryan would ultimately be most associated with the welterweight and middleweight divisions in boxing. Ryan would rack up five straight knockouts before fighting in Detroit on April 30th, 1899 against Detroit native Martin Shaughnessy, knocking him out in the 23rd round of a fight to the finish with two ounce gloves. The two would rematch on June 18th. In the 48th round of a fight that lasted nearly three hours, Ryan landed a left to the neck that sent Shaughnessy flat on his face, unable to answer the count.
The fight took place in front of about 100 spectators, with Ryan winning $50 in addition to gate receipts. Ryan was a student of a time when fighters fought to the finish, and the only way to win a title was via knockout. Fights going well into the double digits as far as rounds were a thing of the norm. On June 6, 1890, Ryan would need only three rounds to knock out Henry Slaughterhouse Baker in Grand Rapids, a fighter who fought the likes of James J. Jeffries and Frank Childs in a short but tough career. On December 10th, Ryan would win a three-round newspaper decision over Frank Gerard in Chicago, a fighter who mixed it up with former world champions Joe Gans and Matty Matthews. By the time 1891 rolled around, Tommy Ryan had a master record of 15-0-1 and, and had passed every test thus far. Lucky for him, the boxing world had started to take notice, and on February 17, 1891, he got the opportunity of a lifetime in a fight against the St. Paul Terror, Danny Needham, in front of around 1,200 spectators at the Twin City Athletic Club with the vacant world welterweight title on the line. The fight would turn out to be a classic, though not because of sustained action throughout, but more for the implications and the overall length of the contest. The two men wore two-ounce gloves. The first quarter of the fight was rather tame as the two men paced themselves for the road ahead. The first knockdown came in round 37 when Needham landed a shot that floored Ryan, who was able to recover. Up to the 59th round, neither fighter had a scratch nor had blood been drawn. In the 61st round, the referee threatened to stop the fight if neither man closed it soon, forcing the two to step up the pace with a nice exchange of blows in the 62nd. After four and a half hours of fighting thus far, the seconds for each man started to jeer and encourage for more action. By round 67, the clock struck 2 a.m., with both men tired and not offering much through the 68th. In the 74th round, Ryan landed a left to the jaw that sent Needham staggering into the ropes, though he was able to recover. In the 75th, Ryan landed another hard shot on Needham, even fouling Needham several times, which caused a commotion. In the 76th round, Needham came out groggy and was caught with a left-to-right combination that sent him staggering into the ropes. With both eyes... All right, folks. All right, back in the mix here. That was a quick, I had to step away for a quick second. Uh, yeah. Work getting done at the house, you know, you can't plan for that. Or, uh, or at least sometimes some stuff happens unpredictably. So craziness, craziness right there. Uh, real quick, catching up on the, I appreciate everyone staying here. We'd love to see his style in boxing. Certainly, certainly there, Joshua. Amazing. Tupper Ryan and Jeffries and Bob Armstrong were a three-man traveling trio. Oh, yes. That's good stuff right there. You know, uh, in the Denver Ed Martin video, I mentioned that, yeah, apparently Tommy Ryan, he trained James J. Jeffries while he was actually competing for that James J. Corbett fight. So that's pretty amazing right there. Salute to you, Ross Clot 222 says, Sup 86, I'm tuning in. Appreciate you being here, Ross Clot, no doubt about it. Uh, so, yeah, uh, that's pretty crazy. Um, yeah, that he uh, trained James J. Jeffrey, so he was legit. He was still kind of in kind of fighting shape or spirit at that particular time. He might have been still fighting, as a matter of fact. Jeffries and Armstrong had them fight 50x. Oh, uh, you're on it, Dan. See, Dan, you're on it. Yeah, that is the case right there. See, you're on it. Talking about what I'm talking about there. Joshua would say, I have this film in my collection. Good stuff right there, Joshua. Appreciate it, buddy. Appreciate it. Go to the box rec and read about Ryan. Not his record, but his box rec bio. Very good. Oh, yeah, certainly, certainly. He uh, was one of those guys. Man, it's almost a travesty. He doesn't get mentioned as much as he probably should these days. Uh, many people tend to not go back that far, but when you do and you dive into his history as well as just the overall history of a number of those fighters from that time, from that time do you realize the greatness that is being missed uh, during that period? And it's 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 pretty much crazy that that tends to happen. But Tommy Ryan, man, one of these great fighters who should be mentioned more. We think about great welterweights and middleweights. He ranks amongst both. And he wasn't even a huge middleweight. He was a smaller guy. So he was his optimal weight. If we were to put him in this era, it would probably be 154 pounds. That would probably be his optimal weight because he often fought at the middleweight limit being under 
middleweight being down in the low 150s, you know, and he could get down to the low 140s in all actuality. So it is uh, it is uh, pretty crazy to think about it. Uh, Joshua says, oh, there's some work with the uh, Doug Lip. <laughs> certainly, certainly there, Joshua. All good. Um, so cert what, one of the things, hey, that video is worth checking out for sure. If you haven't seen one, Tommy Ryan – Tommy Ryan, it's a video worth checking out. Uh, it's on the channel, the 86 Boxing channel, uh, how to knock a man out because that's what Tommy Ryan had to do back in his day. That Needham fight is the real deal, legit. So got to know. Uh, Dan says he could be the greatest. You're right. He's always listed amongst the greats, but he could possibly be the greatest. Without a doubt there, without a doubt, his name should be in that billing as the greatest of all time. And he could very well be the greatest of all time at both welterweight and middleweight. And, hey, if you just look at the accounts of what he was able to do during his time, then you'll understand why. He is a, he is a legitimate boxing great. Tommy Ryan, the Hall of Famer extraordinaire. But if you just read the accounts, then I think that tells even more. If you look on the video that is on the channel uh, that speaks on Tommy Ryan, as a matter of fact, you look at some of the recent videos. If you go to there, go to the 86 Boxing Channel, you'll see it there. Uh, there are also varying articles, etc., that are linked that were sourced through the making of the video and such. But you can just use that as a catalyst to read the varying accounts of what he was able to do in his career. Of course, I don't touch on and get to everything. That video is about 29 minutes. Uh, thus far, each video has gotten longer as time has gone on. So it could potentially warrant some off-screen videos of his because it doesn't touch on every single detail, but it gives a good account of just his career in general. You get a view of the types of opponent types of opponents that he ended up going up against. And you really recognize how great he was through, by virtue of watching that video. So I do recommend it for those who haven't seen it, the Tommy Ryan video, and recognize this great champion for what he was. He, he was a great champion, and he went on to be a great trainer as well. So he trained a number of fighters. He would also go on these traveling shows just exhibiting the sport of boxing or at least the technique and the scientific style of boxing. So I have some accounts of that as well. He actually went to Little Rock, Arkansas, or Hot Springs, Arkansas, I believe it was actually, uh, on one of these road shows, you know, those guys kind of capitalizing off of their name and fame, I guess you can say, from what they were able to do in the ring. So Tommy Ryan is no different. Again, former world welterweight champion and former world middleweight champion and just one of the great boxers that the sport is seen. So the notion of the boxers in the past not being technical, not being scientific, that that might as well be just removed from your mind because trust me when I tell you that Tommy Ryan, he was every bit as skilled as whoever you may think is your favorite or most skilled boxer here today. And if you read the accounts, you will get a true understanding of such. And I appreciate those who... Go back and try to understand these videos. Appreciate you there, Dan. Uh, I, I, I go back. I appreciate those who, like myself, just go back and try to understand these, understand the history of the sport. I think that is a big piece of it. You can't forget about those that came before us for sure. And it's easy to kind of just gaff them off. It's easy to shove them aside, etc. But these guys were great, and they were very skilled. And boxing was the number one sport at that particular time. It was the number one money generator. These boxers were making more than anyone in society, just uh, outside of, you know, the richest of the rich, your Rockefellers and all that stuff. But just in general, especially from a sports perspective, a lot of these other sports were in their infancy or hadn't been truly conceived. So boxing was the number one sport. So much like, with anything today, the sport that can generate the most funding, then you're going to have a lot of individuals, a lot of competition that is lining up to be involved. So therefore, these guys were skilled. They were the cream of the crop during that period. 
Uh, Joshua Wood said that is a myth, but Mendoza was bringing hitting and moving uh, way back in the 1700s. True there, true there, Joshua Woods. Uh, Daniel Mendoza, the bare knuckle champion there, who was a smaller guy who was giving it to guys who were much bigger than him because he was scientific and had technique. Same was the case with, I think I mentioned this in the last stream, Jim Belcher. Matter of fact, I just watched a video, or not a video, but a movie on Jim Belcher. And I thought it was pretty good. It's free on Amazon Prime. It's like the Jim Belcher story or something of that nature. But he was a bare knuckle champion. He had some glove fighting as well. Apparently the great grandson or some type of relative of James Fig and um, his dad was a or his granddad was a top level bare knuckler as well. Had a lot of great wins, etc. But it was a good movie. I enjoyed it. Someone had mentioned this on the channel. I need to find that guy. But someone had mentioned him, uh, Jim Belcher, a uh, uh, time before. But Belcher, that movie, check it out. Check it out. Jim Belcher movie. Um, I think you will enjoy it if you just want to learn about some of the bare knuckle era. And then it dives into, of course, a glove fight, which was uh, one of the latter career fights. And I think it's worthwhile. He went up against Henry Pierce in an epic 18-rounder where those two just gave it their all. And uh, Belcher ended up losing. He had lost an eye or had an eye that was – his vision was messed up in his eye. One of the eye, I think it was the right eye because of – or left eye because of a handball or racquetball. One of the two. It said racquetball on Wikipedia. But in the movie, it was like handball or something. And she got hit in the eye. But – Worth checking out, Jim Belcher. Makes me want to do a video on him, but it was a cool story. It, it isn't rated high, but I don't know why on Amazon Prime, but I thought it was a very good movie. I think you have to be into it. Uh, Dan says, Jim Mason in the mid-1800s was teaching great skills and one-punch KO strategy. Certainly, certainly one of the ones who discovered the great Bob Fitzsimmons right there, Dan. Good point right there, for sure. Uh, salute to you, Alex. Salute, gentlemen. John Jackson was it uh, too much gentleman when he grabbed Mendoza lots of hair and beat him scentless. <laughs> it wasn't yet in the rules. A fighter couldn't grab uh, heads of hair. Oh, yeah, that's pretty crazy right there, Campbell. Uh, Alex, that is pretty crazy to go about it in that route. So, yeah, I don't know a ton about Mendoza's overall career. So that is an interesting one. I need to look into that. But yeah, that's pretty insane. I know you can get away with some stuff, uh, certainly in the bare knuckle era, even in London Prize uh, fighting rules, the London Prize ring rules, you could get away with some things. There was some extra holding, clinching, etc., uh, that you could do. There were spiked shoes and things of that nature. I know of guys getting spiked, you name it, the full gamut right there. Pretty crazy. Uh, Dan says Jack Broughton was undefeated for 26 years, lost finally to Jack Slack. You, you just mentioned it. Oh, yeah, Jack Slack. So, yeah, that's Belcher's uh, Belcher's grandfather, Jim Belcher. Good stuff right there, Dan. Look at that. Full of that knowledge right there. Jack Slack. That is the name right there. So that's big time right there. That's big time. It shows you those guys. So fighting, it has a historical presence to it, and the scientific side of it goes way back. So – Contrary to what is mentioned uh, and the belief, you know, you can look at the posing pictures and all that stuff and make an assumption. But contrary to such, these guys could fight. These guys were adaptable. These guys were skilled. It's just the nature of the beast at that particular time. So much respect to them. Uh, Joshua Wood says Dan Dunnelly's right hand laid many great fighters low in the late 1700s. And when he died, they took his right arm and it's on tour. It is on tour today. Uh, well, that's pretty crazy right there. <laughs> that's pretty crazy right there. Um, that's pretty crazy. Irish boxer Dan Donnelly. Oh, yeah, I've seen his picture come up before. I don't know a ton about him, uh, but I've seen his picture come up before. Holy crap right there. Uh, damn. Damn. I see that, what you're talking about there. Uh, I see what you're talking about, um, Joshua. That's pretty crazy. It's pretty darn crazy to see, but I see what you're talking about. <laughs> pretty freaking crazy. 
pretty crazy. Uh, Dan says Rob was not only uh, one of the greatest heavyweights of all time, but he wrote the first rules of boxing book, made the first boxing glove. Yeah, yeah, yes. And that was a game changer right there. I do know of that right there, uh, Dan. Certainly, that was a game changer. Um, man, those are some interesting stories. It would be good to have more details on them. I've, there's some videos on YouTube. I've seen some on some of these guys from back then. Uh, but that is legit. I've done a, like a little photo animation video on both Broughton and Fig. I might have mixed up a picture or two. Both of them had shaved heads or seemingly had shaved heads. Uh, but yeah, certainly pioneers of bringing boxing to that view that we currently have now of it being sort of like a mainstream sport, though it's not at the height it once was for sure. Uh, Alex says Slack, Slack was a uh, thug, didn't care for rules. He had a punch they called the chopper, basically a rabbit punch. Oh, man. <laughs> no joke right there, uh, Alex. Good to know right there. They didn't really uh, detail it in such fashion in that uh, Belcher movie. Uh, uh, but Slack was in there for a, a little bit of portion or, or a good portion of it played by J uh, Russell Crowe. But, yeah, rabbit punches, no joke right there. Those can do some serious damage. We've seen that even here in recent modern times, I guess you can say. Uh, Dan says England has the has a great and unheralded history of boxing. Certainly. Certainly, England goes a long way right there. And I think still, even right now, they have the greatest fans in the sport, They uh, in the sport of boxing. They really turn up in a way that is unseen just across the board overall. But they really turn up for their champions, their fighters, etc. And you got to love it. And I know the fighters love it. So I, I appreciate it and show love to it myself. Yeah, Jim May certainly. Certainly there, Dan. Joshua Woods, you know your stuff, but yeah, Joshua Woods knows that stuff right there. Uh, salute to you, Joshua Woods, of course. Of course, had some had very good com uh, comments or dialogue with uh, Joshua Woods, sharing a lot of great knowledge there. Uh, Joshua, appreciate it for sure. But that stuff, man, that's the beauty of the history right there. Just being able to touch on some of the varying things that have gone down with these fighters these great fighters and what they were able to do in their careers. Again, the great Tommy Ryan, the subject of this video. Look at that record. 82 wins, two losses, 13 draws, six no con no decisions, two no contest, 68 knockouts in those victories. I mean, really doesn't get much better than that. Doesn't get much better than that at all. Two true greats. Are, are just one of the true greats of the sport right there, for sure. Tommy Ryan, former world welterweight and world middleweight champion, is just insane. Joshua Woods mentions the rules at the time. Uh, the rules at the time were – time was mostly up to what the ref would allow. Yeah, certainly. Certainly, yeah, you could get away with, you could get away with some things for sure. Could certainly get away with some things uh, back in those times. Bunch of eye gouging and all that stuff. I ran across stories, uh, yeah, even yeah, in the later 1800s, yeah, where they were doing some pretty crazy things. Uh, Nonpareil Jack Dempsey, he was spiked by Professor Mike Donovan. There's a video on the channel on both of those individuals. But he was spiked in a contest that they had. Or no, he was spiked in a contest with, I forget who he was going up against, but Professor Mike Donovan was the actual official, as a matter of fact, or, or he was in the corner of the opponent. Can't think of who it is at the moment, but I think Dempsey and Mike Donovan, Professor Mike Donovan, that is, I think they had a run-in prior at some point. I believe they did go against each other at some point, if I'm thinking about it correctly here off top. Yeah. Uh, put his arm on tour. Wow, hard, hardcore is it is, and yeah, I looked it up right there, and it is pretty hardcore. Without a doubt, it is hardcore. They had the arm on tour, and they still have it to this day. It looks crazy. It's crazy to think about it, but uh, yeah, it's out there. You got an arm, traveling arm, folks. It's only a traveling arm out there. You look it up if you if you want to know what it looks like. It's very interesting. Uh, Alex says, Tom Sawyer could have been the greatest champion of England. Uh, Tom Sayers. Okay, gotcha. 
Tom Sawyer was uh what is he a uh, writer of a tall tale type guy? I know it was Tom Sawyer, but um he fought uh just here for the international championship. The crowd broke into the ring and the bout was declared a draw. Oh wow, wow, interesting, interesting. Oh Heenan, oh fought Heenan, okay. JC Heenan, maybe. Interesting right there, Alex. That's crazy. Yeah, I heard about yeah, Tom Cribb and Tom Malinu, a similar situation right there where the crowd got involved, I guess, which was customary at that time. Uh, Dan said, true, Alex, he fought a mean guy at Thug, but a great fighter, Jack Slack, grandson. Uh, he was a tough, mean guy at Thug, but a great fighter, Jack Slack, grandson of James Fig. Yep. Yeah, so Fig and Jim, Jim Belcher, grandson of Jack Slack. That's crazy. That's fighting heritage right there. I guess that's when it's in the blood. Uh, Heenan was awesome. Dan says, I got to check out Heenan. I got to check out Heenan. American good buddy was Jim Mace. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I need to check out Heenan. I don't know Heenan. I don't think I know him. Uh, I know Bobby the Brain Heenan, but that's wrestling. Uh, certainly, I got to check out Heenan there that you're mentioning. That's pretty cool. Heenan was a bad MF. Look at his build. All right. Heenan. Cool. I'm going to check him out. That is that's pretty awesome right there. So I do know about, oh, yeah, I see. Oh, I see Heenan here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was a pretty solid guy. You know, I've seen uh, one of these little pictures before of him. I guess I just didn't know. Oh, he knew. And it's pretty amazing that you were able to recount some of these stories. So some of those scribes did an excellent job of just recounting and and maintaining varying things over the course of these uh, fights and the careers that were going on. So big ups. That's, that's kudos right there for sure. John C. Heenan. So he had three fights. So three fights. Tom King, Tom Sayers, a draw. Oh, yeah. That was two hours, ten minutes. Insane. John Morrissey. John Morrissey. Yeah, that's insane. That is some good stuff right there. I know this bare knuckle world is a crazy one. John C. Heenan. Good stuff there, Dan. Yeah, I just caught him right there. Yeah, he's a solid guy right there. Solid guy. Yeah, he was a solidly built guy. 196.2. Good stuff. New York. Oh, he died at 39. What the heck happened? 39 in Wyoming. Hmm. I wonder what happened to him there. But, you know, those are hard times. Hard men, hard circumstances that they were dealing with during those periods. Most certainly. Benica Boy got it. Benicia. Oh, that's what he is there, Alex. Good stuff. The first crib, Malinu fight the crowd. Uh we're into it yeah 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 certainly yeah i, I had uh read up and heard some mention of that particular fight right there uh what joshua yeah when they come in some broken fingers were involved a mix of varying things uh from what i recall very interesting right very interesting how that goes down but yeah hey you know there's i did a video on Jack McAuliffe, the first light heavyweight champion of the world. And I know in one of those fights, I can't remember who he was going against, but it was a situation where it looked as though he was about to get knocked out. And then the crowd stormed the ring and there was a bunch of commotion, um, I guess, brawling and a mix going on. It ended up being declared a draw. So he ended up being technically undefeated uh, during his career. I think it was 30-something plus fights. He had a number of draws that were tied into the mix as well, but that was one where he was almost out of there. It's interesting, yeah. So the crowd does get involved. Uh, no holes barred in some sense uh, back in those days. Uh, the second Crip fight, Crip broke Tom's jaw. Okay, gotcha right there. Alex, awesome stuff right there. You know, yeah, I want to dive a bit more into uh, some of the uh, bare knuckle stuff. That Jim Belcher movie in itself was inspiring. Just hearing about some of that and would have been different if I saw it, you know, many, many, many years ago or whatever. 
But yeah, I heard the references to uh, Broughton and Fig, for sure Fig, but I think they mentioned Broughton in there as well. And it was just like, hmm, I know what they're talking about, as a matter of fact. So it's always interesting when you get an understanding of such. Matter of fact, I might have to watch a boxing movie here tonight. Why not? No, uh, we've talked about varying ones over the course of uh, some of these chats. I might have to watch one here tonight. So I've seen that Jim Belcher movie. I've seen Gentleman Jim. And then there are a number of other ones you all recommended that I know that I have to check out as well, Raging Bull being one of them. But I'm going to see what's out there. I'm going to uh, probably watch something tonight. I think it'll be a good a good opportunity to watch something. Uh, Dan says, Jim Mace, three continents, Europe, Australia, America. He encountered great prejudice in his life by the Irish who tried to kill him in Australia and America, but he won over the, uh, won them over eventually with skill. That's good stuff right there. That's good stuff for sure. The great Jim Mace. You know, I want to do a video on him. Uh, Jim Mace, because he had a number of boxing matches, uh, the bulk of them against the same individual. I think I've mentioned this before. But uh, that being said, great fighter right there. Great fighter. And he would fight bigger guys. I know this is something you've mentioned before as well, Dan. So that's an interesting one right there. I got to check more of him out. Uh, another great round from Cribs, Tim Tom Spring, known as the Clever Fighter from around Cribs Town. So Tim Tom Spring, okay. Tim Tom Spring. I had to check it out there. Uh, I had to check that out. Oh, or Tom Spring. Tom Spring. Okay, okay. I've heard the name before, as a matter of fact. I've seen one of these pictures, too. Uh, well, no, I'm seeing the Korea picture, not the Tom Spring one, but okay, from 1795 to 1851, English Brad Knuckle Fighter, from Champion of England from 1822 to 24, that's good stuff right there. Yeah, it's always, uh, it's always pretty awesome. Hey, it's good that we have some of these uh, historic accounts to uh, fall back on. Certainly. Oh, yeah, I believe that, Dan. So he's considered a gypsy and undesirable. Yeah, yeah, that's how they do with the uh, gypsies. Last fight at 878. <laughs> yeah, I know he had a uh, – it was a fight or exhibition. I, I don't know what they call it, maybe exhibition-ish uh, style. But he had a fight with uh, – Professor Mike Donovan during um, 18 or during like, yeah, the early 1900s, maybe. I know he was a little bit older in age, but th those who were getting at it, Professor Mike Donovan is another one who was pretty solid. The hand that shook the hand of John L. All right. <laughs> Good stuff there, Joshua Woods. Shake the hand, the, shake the hand of John L. Sullivan. So he also shook the hand of Sullivan. Died 79 penniless in an Egyptian account. That's pretty crazy, considering such a great fighter. Sad story to see there with some of these great fighters who uh, end up that way right there, Dan. Dan Dunley had the same problem, uh, Sullivan, and mainly plain old silks had whiskey. Gotcha right there, Alex. Yeah, that could be a challenge for sure. Yeah, that seemed to be an uh, issue for Jack Slack, according to that movie, that uh, Belcher, Jim Belcher movie, Jack Slack had his... Uh, Runs with the same thing there. It's crazy how that is, huh? That's what it was. I wonder, meet, uh, wonder meeting and shaking their hands with Larry Holmes if I am in line of getting a handshake from John. <laughs> maybe right there, Joshua. Maybe. Maybe that is the case right there. <laughs> that is funny, though. I think so. I shook hands with Larry Holmes, too. Oh, hey, look at that. That's good stuff right there. I haven't run across Larry. I haven't run across Larry here. During my time, uh, maybe one of these days, the great Larry Holmes, I'll uh, run across him at some point for sure. Uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. But, man, great stuff. Yeah, I have some work going on here at the home as well. So got to tend to some of that here. Uh, but, man, this has been great. I've enjoyed this, of course. Hopefully everyone else has enjoyed it. We had a discussion on Tommy Ryan. Probably could have dove in a bit more, but. Certainly got a good bit of detail out of there. There's some boxing on tonight, some live boxing. As a matter of fact, worth checking out. I believe something is on this 
But TNT, there was a show from England that was happening then. The Zone, or some of it may be tomorrow too, but certainly worth checking out. But uh, man, it's been great. I appreciate everyone who dropped in. Dan, Joshua, Alex. Uh, but mom even dropped in the mix here. Uh, Raz Clot, The Boz, Flat Boxing, Bruce Gass, Rodolfo Rivera Jr., Random, just a number of people. Uh, the great Madame Volker uh, being a uh, John L. Line. Yeah, yeah, you probably are, but um, certainly, Boz, appreciate you there, Boz. Yeah, we're getting ready to head out of here. That, that's really real good. Hey, we'll discuss it there, Boz. We'll have to discuss that for sure. Um, <laughs> that's pretty funny, though. But no, this has been great. We got into a little bare knuckle discussion, and probably more of that it was worthy of discussion as we move forward too. So, I'm gonna look up some stuff. Talk about Bill Richmond. I, I I heard about him on a NPR a little National Public Radio uh, discussion that took place a number of years back. So, it's always good uh, checking out that. But as it relates to John L. Sullivan, oh uh, yeah. Sullivan was a mean looking dude when he was younger, for sure. Shake the hand that shook the hand of John L. Sullivan, as they say. Holmes meet Lewis, met, who uh, met Dempsey, who met Tunney, then Corbett, who met. Hey, you might be in that line there, Woods. You shook the hand of the hand that shook the hand of the hand, you know? So that's pretty that's pretty awesome right there. Yeah, 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 that is pretty awesome right there. <laughs> so we're in that Sullivan lineage, that Sullivan line. Cheers to John L. Sullivan. Uh, the Boston Strong Boy, first world heavyweight champion. But no, this has been great. Uh, man, so we're going to do it again. We'll see what's up for next week. I'm going to set something up for sure. Uh, but hey, I hope to catch you all here. In the meantime, check out that Denver Ed Martin video if you have it. And let's talk about what other discussions can come about. Uh, enjoy your weekend, folks. Enjoy your weekend for sure. <laughs> What about? Oh, yeah, yeah, certainly there, Alex. Hey, many have taken on that trait right there. Got to end the fight before the fight starts. But uh, certainly enjoy your weekend, folks. Hey, I appreciate everyone who dropped in.